Namaste. Today we begin our next lecture which is the study of behaviors and behavioral ecology. So, before we begin let us look at the definitions. What is behavioral ecology? Behavioral ecology is the study of the evolutionary basis for animal behavior due to ecological pressures. So, essentially what we are saying when we say behavioral ecology is that we say that there is an ecological pressure which is governing the behavior of animals and we are trying to understand what is the relationship between both of these and how that also plays a role in the evolutionary process. Behavior refers to the ways that organisms respond to each other and to particular cues in the environment. So, essentially, so if you have a stimulus and that stimulus is resulting in a response, so the way in which the organism is utilizing or sensing this stimulus making all the, the computations about what to do and giving out this response all this is known as behavior. And uh, the study of behaviors, the scientific study of animal behavior goes by the name of ethology. And there are a number of topics that we study in the case of behavioral ecology. We study foraging behaviors which means how do animals eat, how do they decide which thing to eat, what not to eat and so on anti predator behaviors. So, how do animals try to avoid their own predators? How do they try to save themselves? Social behaviors, how do animals behave in a group and also the mating behaviors and so on. And one fundamental approach through which we understand behaviors goes by the name of the cost benefit approach. Now, the cost benefit analysis is an assessment to determine whether the cost of an activity is less than the benefit that can be expected from that activity. So, to give a simple example, suppose I consider that the cost of this pen is say 10 rupees and the benefit that I will derive by using this pen or by getting this pen is say 15 rupees. So, in that case I will go and do uh, and get this pen. So, that will be a behavior. On the other hand, if I think that the cost of this pen is again 10 rupees, but the benefit that I will get out of getting this pen is say 5 rupees. So, in that case, why should I go for this pen? Maybe I will I would not get go for this pen. Now, similarly, an animal also has to make a number of choices. So, for instance, there is a tiger and that tiger sees a sambar in front of it. Now, this tiger has to make some calculations. How far is that sambar? What is the terrain that is between the tiger and the sambar. If that terrain is extremely rugged, if this tiger has to say climb up a mound and then get back, probably it would not go for hunting this sambar, because the activity by which it will go and hunt the sambar will also entail quite a lot of cost in terms of energetics. So, the tiger will be expending its energy to get to that sambar to, uh, to chase that sambar and to kill that sambar. Now, the benefit that the tiger will get if it goes for this attempt is the energy or the nutrition that it will get by eating that sambar. Now, if the cost is more than the benefit, if the if this terrain is extremely rugged and there is a very low probability that this, this tiger will be able to eat the sambar. So, in that case when the cost is more than the benefit, the tiger will probably not go for this uh, for chasing this sambar. On the other hand, if the benefit is much greater than the cost. So, for instance, this this tiger sees that it was resting somewhere and this sambar came near itself. So, it does not have to run a very great distance. At the same time, uh, this tiger is hungry. So, essentially it requires these nutrients. It puts a very high price or a, a, a very high value on nutrition. So, in that case, this tiger will go and attack the sambar and maybe kill it and eat it. So, Essentially, we perform something when the cost less than the, the benefit. So, in that case, you have the behavior that will happen, and if the cost is greater than the benefit, then you will you will probably have some other behavior which we will refer to as by B prime. So, in this case, the, the second behavior 
in the case of our tiger would be to do nothing or maybe to take some bit more of rest. Now, in this context this curve becomes important. <coughs> now, here we are trying to put uh, so in this case we are trying to understand what is the territory size that will be used by an organism by putting this territory size here and the cost or benefit as uh, the territory size changes on the y axis. So, the y axis is cost or benefit the x axis is the territory size. Now, for instance, if there is a tiger that has a small territory. So, if you have a small territory you have a small amount of benefit because you can only hunt n number of animals that are present in your territory and at the same time the cost of defending that territory is also less because there is a very small area that needs to be defended. Now, if the territory size increases, so the cost increases. Now, our tiger will have to expend much more amount of energy to defend that territory. So, the cost of defense increases like this. So, earlier it was very less and then it is increasing exponentially and then when you have a very large size territory any small bit of increase in the size will entail quite a lot of cost to defend that territory. On the other hand if you look at the benefits that are gained if you have a very small territory you have a very little amount of benefit. Now, as territory size increases your benefits increase, but then they start getting saturated after a while because for instance if a tiger is able to, to kill only one prey every week. So, it, it is killing somewhere around 50 preys in a year. Now, if it is able to get 50 preys in this much size of territory that is good enough for it. Now, if that size increases, so at this size you have like 100 animals that are available to be killed at this size you have around 200 animals that are available to be killed, but then a tiger is only going to eat somewhere around 50 animals. So, what is it going to do by having 200 animals in its territory that does not make any sense. So, in that case we will say that the benefit increases, but after a while it starts saturating. So, which is why we are seeing that this curve is becoming more and more parallel to the x axis. Now, as territory size increases, so in this area we will say that the benefit is greater than the cost in this area. So, all of these areas are or all of these territory sizes are those that the tiger will go for. If we look at this area, so at this particular size of territory we have the cost of defense is greater than the benefit that is being provided by that size of territory. So, a tiger may not go for that size of a territory. So, all of these the uh, the area which is or the curve that is from here to here. Now, this is the area in which the tiger is going to operate. Now, amongst all of these different sizes there would be one size that is the most optimum size. So, if the tiger goes for this size, so the, the benefit minus the cost which is the profit is which very large. If for instance the territory size is this much. So, let us draw this curve. So, here we have the territory size and here we have the cost or benefit. Now, in this case the cost increases like this and the benefit goes like this. Now, this is the benefit. Now, if we are considering a territory size of this much. So, at this territory size the cost and benefit are equal. So, the profit net profit is 0 and similarly at this particular point you have the net profit is equal to 0. Now, at this size of the territory we have a profit that is given by this much which is the benefit minus the cost and at this size you have a profit that is given by this much size which is the benefit minus cost and if you take another area to the left again the profit reduces. So, if we say that we have these profits of P 1, P 2, P 3. So, in that case we have P 1 is less than P 2 and P 3 is also less than P 2. So, P 2 is the maximum. So, in this case this territory size will be called as the most optimum size 
of the territory because here your benefits are much greater than the cost. Now, if we consider a territory size like this, so at this particular size we have the benefit that is given by this much. So, this is the benefit and the cost is given by this much. So, the benefit is less than the cost. So, actually your tiger will be expending much more amount of energy and is getting very little in return. So, probably it will not go for that particular size. So, by doing such an analysis we can uh, we can compute or try to understand why certain behaviors are preferred by animals and why certain behaviors are not preferred by the animals. Now, we will look at another example, okay. uh, we will look at another example. Now, this example is about why do carnivores live in groups. Now, here we are considering uh, a theoretical case in which you have lions and the x axis is showing you the group size of the lions and the y axis is showing you the group hunting success. So, essentially group hunting success means that if the group of a particular size is going for a kill, so it has spotted a prey animal and it is going for a kill. So, what is the probability that it will that this group will be able to kill the prey and get the food. Now, if there is only one lion in the group, so if you have the point here, so uh, the group hunting success is only about 0 0.3, which means that uh, only 3 out of 10 animals or roughly 1 out of 3 animals that is is being hunted gets hunted. Now, if you have more number of lions in the group, so suppose you have two number of lions, so the hunting efficiency increases point from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. So, in the first case you had a situation that the lion was able to get food only one in three cases. In the second case it gets food rough, roughly 50 percent of the time and as the size of the group increases and if they are able to cooperate fully, so we will have a situation in which the group hunting success will become closer and closer to 1. So, essentially if you have like 10 lions in the group and these 10 lions are cooperatively trying to hunt an animal, so there is a very good chance that they will actually be able to hunt that animal, but that only happens if the lions are cooperating fully. Whereas, if the lions are trying to cheat or if the lions are trying to hunt by themselves and they are not cooperating. So, one lion is not cooperating with the next lion. So, the hunting efficiency will not increase. So, this is what our theoretical model states. Now, if you look at actual field situations of the lions and if we see these lions of Uganda, so we will observe that the actual situation is somewhere in between. So, actually you have lions that cooperate for some time and they also try to cheat for some time. So, this is a way in which we can understand why the lions are, are living in groups. We can even dissect it further by looking at the cost and benefits of group living for lions. Now, we consider the cases of males and females separately. Now, if you are living in a group and if you are a male lion, so there will be a sharing of paternity, which means that uh, if there is only one lion and uh, or say uh, if in the group you only have one male lion, so all the cubs that are uh, born in this particular pride will be fathered by only that particular lion. But if that lion is allowing another male lion to live inside that group, so that male lion may also give rise to the progeny. So, in that case the paternity of the cubs is being shared by both of these lions. If you have say 3 or 4 male lions that are living together, so all 4 of them will be sharing the, the paternity or in other words the lion, the, uh, the one male lion that was earlier having an exclusive access to all the females now has to share the females between both um, between the other lions. So, that is a cost of grouping for the male lion. The benefit of grouping for the male lion is that it has an increased access to mates. So, for instance, if you had only a single lion, so it would not be able to compete with the, the, the already existing prides. So, it will not be able to make a space for itself, but then if it combines with another male lion and if they work cooperatively, so in that case they will be able to, to topple the other prides and take their females. So, it, uh, so, the benefit of grouping is that it increases the access to mates. And also it provides uh, protection to the offspring 
against infanticide. What does that mean? If you have a pride in which you have uh, male lions and female lionesses and if that pride is toppled over, so essentially the male lions uh, have been defeated by an incoming group. So, what this incoming group will do is that it will kill off all the cubs that are there in this pride. Why? Because uh, the male lions that are coming from outside they also want to mate and the females will not get into uh, heat if they are having cubs with them. So, the incoming lions will try to kill off the, uh, the, off the existing offsprings to make way for their own offsprings. Now, as we saw in one of the earlier lectures, we always talk about fitness. Now, fitness does not mean that you give rise to more number of progeny. It means that you give rise to more number of progeny and more and more of them are able to survive and able to reproduce to the next generation as well. So, if the lions are able to, to produce cubs, but if those cubs get eaten up or are killed by incoming lions, so, that does not make much sense evolutionarily. So, which is why we have this behavior that the lions even though they have this cost of sharing the paternity, even then they will try to remain in group, they will also allow other lions to come and cooperate with themselves. So, that they have an increased access to mates and by providing a united front, it is much more uh, plausible that the, uh, that, the, uh, that the pride in which these cooperating lions are there will not be toppled and so their offsprings will have protection against infanticide. Now, that is for the male lions, what is the benefit for the female lions or the lionesses? Why do lionesses also live in the group? Now, lionesses live in the group because, uh, so again here we have the cost and benefits. The cost of living in the group is a lower rate of food intake because the larger the size of the group, the more, uh, uh, the, the lesser the amount of food that you will have from every hunt. Whereas, it also has some benefits, there is help from the kin and there is territorial defense. So, in, in protection of their cubs and uh, in performing uh, the grooming of the cubs, they also get help from their siblings. And then it also helps in territorial defense, because you have more number of lions and lionesses that are defending the same amount of territory. Now, as we saw before, there is a cost, there is a benefit both for males and females. So, the males and the females will, uh, will normally go for the cost benefit approach and wherever the, uh, the benefit minus the cost is the greatest, that would be the optimum number of males and the optimum number of females that will come together to form the group. Now, similarly, herbivores also live in groups. Again, why? Because like this is a paper that demonstrated that when you have bisons that are living together and there is this pack of wolves. Now, if again if you have a big sized pack of wolves, so they will be able to hunt much more efficiently if they are if they are able to cooperate with each other. Now, similarly, if the bisons are there in the group, in that case the wolves will find it extremely difficult to hunt the bisons, because they will put up a united front for defense. But if the bisons uh, become solitary, if one of the bison lags behind, so, in that case that particular bison will be attacked by the wolves from all sides and then it will get eaten up. So, we can see that in the uh, case of group living animals, if you look at the cost and benefit, the benefits are increased foraging efficiency. So, essentially if you are hunting together, if you are living together, if you are hunting together, so there is a greater chance that you will be able to hunt somebody. In the case of these wolves, they were able to hunt because they are of a larger size. If there was a single wolf, probably it would not be able to hunt the bison. On the other hand, the cost is that there is competition for food and there is an increased risk of diseases or parasites. Now, because this bison was hunted by so many wolves, so all these wolves will have to share the flesh. So, in that case, that is a cost that is associated with the group living. And at the same time, because they are living together, if one of these wolves gets sick, so that would also spread diseases to the other wolves. So, by living together, there is a, a greater propensity that you become prey to diseases. Now, the other potential benefit is that of reduced 
predation whereas it uh, the cost is the uh, attraction of predators what do we mean by this if you are living together so for instance if this bison was not a part of this group but was living alone so in that case this bison would normally have been hunted long back but because you have all of these bison that are putting together a united front so only one of them will get hunted and the others will be able to survive so that is a benefit the cost is that if you have a larger sized group so more number of predators might get attracted to hunt this particular group so again you have cost and benefits other potential benefits are increased access to mates whereas the potential cost are loss of paternity and brood parasitism now what does that mean uh, if you if you are living together in a big group so uh, the animal has got a greater access to the mates because you have more number of males and females that are living together so it is much more likely that you have an access to a mate the potential cost is loss of paternity as we saw before because the mates are not uh, are not exclusively available to any particular organism and also there is a chance of brood parasitism in which the uh, uh, in which you can have a situation uh, where uh, an outsider can come into your group mate with the females and then move out similarly you have the potential benefit of help from the kin if you are trying to raise your kids and the potential cost is loss of individual reproduction now by looking at different cost and benefit analysis we can also understand various ecological behaviors like uh, this community interactions that we saw before you have this langur here you have the cheetals here and they are interacting because the cheetals are getting access to the leaves and the fruits from these trees when the langur is dropping them the cheetal is also having uh, an um, a benefit of having these eyes that are uh, the eyes of the langur that are on top of the tree and are able to see the predators on the other hand the langurs are also getting some amount of benefit from the cheetals because the cheetals are able to sense the the predators from a lower height so um, these cost and benefit analysis can help us understand different community interactions in ecology now another example is if you are living in a group then there is a chance that you will find a predator nearby and you have to make a decision whether or not you should give out an alarm call now what is an alarm call now this is a ground dwelling squirrel so this is a a species of of a squirrels that lives on the ground it lives as part of a group and whenever it sees a predator it gives out this alarm call now if you give out an alarm call you are alerting everybody in the group that there is a predator nearby but then the predator will also hear your alarm call so in that case you are making yourself much more visible to the predator so there is a chance that the predator in place of uh, of of hunting anybody else will go after you because you have made your position extremely clear to the predator by giving out this alarm call so again you have the cost and benefit of giving out an alarm call you have the cost and you have the benefit the cost is that you are using up your energy to make the alarm call and the other cost is that you are making yourself visible to the predators the benefit is that you are able to save the group so is this behavior now the question here is the cost is something that you are entailing to yourself so you can get killed if you make the alarm call the benefit is something that you are making to the group because you are saving not yourself but the other organisms that are there in the group so here we are looking at one question of population dynamics so we have this population of ground squirrels and every squirrel has to make this decision 
whether or not to give an alarm call. If there is an alarm call, it is putting itself to a risk, it is using up its own energy and the benefits are not coming to itself, but are coming to the other members that are there in the group. So, uh, in the first instance, it might look like any squirrel that is giving out an alarm call is sacrificing itself for the group. So, is it a case of altruism or are we observing some other points that are working here or are at play here to give up this behaviors. So, this phenomena was studied. So, scientists try to understand when do you make a call. So, here we have a, a graph of the callers regardless of precedence to a predatory mammal. So, here we see that if you have these adult females and here we have an expected rate of calling and here we have the observed rate of calling. Now, expected rate of calling is given by computing. Uh, so, expected values are computed by assuming that animals call randomly in direct proportion to the number of times they are present when a, predat when a predatory mammal appears. So, essentially if you have more number of females or if you have situations in which the females were there when there was uh, uh, this this predatory animal that had come there. So, we put a random chance that every animal is going to make a, a call every n number of times. So, from that we get this expected rate of calling and here you observe the observed rate of calling. So, this is what actually happens on the ground. Now, you can see here that the females were expected to call say 41 percent of time but they actually called around 65 percent of time. So, their, uh, their calling was much greater than what we had expected. In the case of adult males, we had expected them to call around 25 percent of times, but they actually called just around 8 percent of time. Now, in the case of one year females, we had expected them to call say around 15 percent of times, but they also called somewhere around 38 percent of times. So, in the case of one year females as well as in the case of the adult females, we observe that their observed rates of calling are much greater than the expected rates of calling. Now, in the case of one year males, we had expected them to call around 10 percent of time and they actually called say around 5 percent of time. So, here also the observed rate was much less than what was expected and in the case of juveniles, it was very much less than what was expected. Now, the question is, so why do females call more than expected and why do males call less than expected? So, what is there that is making the females put themselves more at risk to alert their group? So, this question brings us to the concept of kin selection. Now, in the case of these ground dwelling squirrels, it is observed that the females generally live together and the males after they have reached some stage of maturity, they move out. So, essentially if a female is calling up uh, is giving out this alarm call, it is alerting most of its own relatives. Whereas, the male does not have much to lose in terms of genes if one of the members or more of the members of the group gets killed, because the male wants to uh, protect its own genes, because it is in any case going to move somewhere else. So, the male puts much more price on saving itself than saving the group. Whereas, the female puts a much greater price on saving the group than on saving itself, because it has more number of genes that are common with that of the group. So, here we have the concept of kin selection and kin selection says the evolution of traits that increase the survival and ultimately the reproductive success of one's relatives. Now, in the case of kin selection, if we are observing this behavior that you have organisms that are trying to uh, that are even willing to sacrifice themselves to save somebody else from their own kin that is which are relatives. If this behavior is being observed, it means that this behavior must have evolved over time. Now, if there is a behavior that has evolved over time, then this behavior 
must be providing more fitness because if you have uh, a situation in which there is a behavior that gives you more amount of fitness only then that behavior will be uh, selected through the process of natural selection and only then such a behavior will be evolved and which is why we are observing this behavior. Now, the question is how is it possible that by sacrificing yourself you are getting a fitness and by you I mean not just you, but your genes how are your genes getting to a situation that they are more fit to survival if they are sacrificed. Now, here we also have another uh, uh, corollary which is known as group selection natural selection for traits that favor groups rather than individuals because group selection operates much more slowly than the individual selection. So, it is a much weaker selective force in most circumstances. Now, in this case what we are seeing that when we have the skin selection we are also observing a group selection kin selection is only uh, working when you are working in a large size group and in this group your own fitness is not that important as is the fitness of the whole of the group. Now, why is that so? So, Hamilton gave us this rule which says that genes increase in frequency when we have this formula that works. So, we have r into b is greater than c where r is the genetic relatedness of the recipient to the actor often defined as the, the probability that a gene picked randomly from each at the same locus is identical by descent. So, r is the genetic relatedness between the recipient and the actor. In this case the actor is the ground squirrel that is giving out the alarm call and the recipients are the other members of the group. Now, capital B is the additional reproductive benefit that is gained by the recipient of the altruistic act. Now, reproductive benefit that is gained by the recipient by this we mean that when the ground squirrel made out the alarm call the other members of the group they were saved and they were able to reproduce and their progeny were, was able to survive. So, that is the additional reproductive benefit that it got because there was one squirrel that sacrificed itself. If that squirrel had not sacrificed itself or had not given out the alarm call which increases the chances of it getting sacrificed. So, in that case uh, more and more members of the group would have been killed and so their progeny would also be less. And C is the reproductive cost to the individual performing the act which is the reproductive cost of the squirrel that gave out the alarm call. So, basically what we are saying here is that if you have an individual and this individual has a number of other relatives now if you have to make a choice whether you should kill yourself or whether you should have the whole of this group killed so how do you make that choice it will depend on one how much are you related to the big group so for instance if the level of relatedness is very less. So, basically this individual is related to this individual and all the other members are not uh, related to the uh, actor individual or A. So, the other members are not related to A only B is related to A. So, in that case because A and B have different num uh, have different genes. So, A would try to protect itself even at the cost of the whole of the group because it does not have much to lose if the group dies off. On the other hand if A has a relative here, here, here. So, if all of these are related to A. So, in that case if A sacrifices itself and is able to save so many members of the group. So, more and more of the genes that were present in A are getting a survival because the, the group gets a survival or to put it in uh, the words of Haldane. So, Haldane gave up this statement if an individual loses its life to save two siblings. Now, you have a situation you have a mom and a dad and then you have say three siblings. Now, 
these are the paternal chromosomes. So, if this is paternal, this is maternal. Now, this individual has 50 percent genes from P and 50 percent genes from M. And similarly, this individual has 50 percent from P, 50 percent from M. And similarly, this individual has 50 percent from P and 50 percent from M. Now, if this individual, if individual A sacrifices itself to save B and C together. So, in that case, by losing 50 percent of genes of P, it is saving more than 50 percent genes of P. So, by losing 50 percent of genes of P, by sacrificing itself, it is able to save more than 50 percent of genes of P. And by losing these 50 percent of genes of M, it is able to save more than 50 percent genes of M. So, essentially in genetic terms, it is a benefit. So, if an individual loses its life to save two siblings or four nephews or eight cousins, it is termed to be a fair deal in evolutionary terms as siblings are on average 50 percent identical by descent, nephews are 25 percent identical by descent and cousins are 12.5 percent identical by descent. Now, another example of how behavior plays a role in ecology is the case of territoriality. Now, territoriality is a type of intraspecific or interspecific competition. So, intraspecific is within the same species, interspecific is between two or more species that results from the behavioral exclusion of others from a specific space that is defended as a territory. So, what do we mean by that? If you have this much space and there is a tiger that is defending this area, so it will not allow any other tiger to come to this area. So, this is a territorial behavior. Now, the purpose is animal territoriality aims at excluding conspecifics. So, conspecifics are individuals of the same species. So, like another tiger. So, animal territoriality is aims at excluding conspecifics. So, if you have this tiger here, it will not allow this tiger to come into this territory. So, it is excluding another member of the same species or occasionally animals of other species. So, for instance, if you if this tiger is not allowing a leopard to get into this territory, then it is uh, then we will say that it is excluding an animal of another species from certain areas through the use of auditory, visual or olfactory signals as well as aggressive or ritualized behaviors. So, what would this tiger do to exclude other? It would give out some amount of auditory signals. So, essentially it will start growling uh, for instance or it will give out some amount some sort of visual signals by say scratching on uh, different trees. So, that it makes a mark. So, if there is a bark of a tree, this tiger will go and scratch on the bark, so that it makes it known to everybody that I am here. So, this is my calling card or it might say uh, scratch on the ground or it might give out some olfactory signals. Olfactory signals means that this tiger will go close to a tree and then it will give out a, a spray of urine on that particular tree, so that it is giving out its smell that this is my area. So, by doing all of these different behaviors, it is excluding others from its own territory and this might also involve aggressive behaviors. Aggressive behaviors is when one tiger attacks another. So, here we are looking at one problem of population ecology. So, population ecology will try to understand uh, how these uh, individuals in a population or members of the same species that are living together, how are they? interacting with each other. So, territoriality is one way in which they are interacting. So, what sorts of behaviors do we see? Well, we can find tigers that are uh, hunting uh, which are uh, not hunting, but uh, actually attacking each other. We have seen this example of penguins that were showing out uh, this uh, ritualized behavior. So, they pegged at another and also they gave out this uh, sound or we saw these black bugs that were also showing this aggressive behavior. So, in this case also they are excluding others from their own areas. Now, if we have territoriality, 
why do we have territoriality is the question why did this territorial behavior evolve what are the costs and benefits of having this territorial behavior now the cost is increased energy usage because if you have to defend a territory you will have to go around you will have to make multiple rounds you will have to patrol that territory which requires energy if you have to to show a ritualized behavior or aggression that also requires energy that also requires time so increased time demands and also in an increased re, uh, risk of predation why because when you are targeting or when you are uh, using all of your time and energy against a member of your own species so it it is much more likely or very easy for a predator to hunt you so for instance if there is um, an animal that is engaged in a ritualized behavior if you have a, a sambar that is doing a preaching behavior now what is a preaching behavior a sambar will uh, go to a very tall tree or a, a tree that is situated at a height and there this sambar will stand up on two of its legs and then it will uh, give out uh, some some visual displays or it will give out some os, some olfactory uh, signals at that particular location so that ev so that it is uh, known to everybody that this is the biggest size sambar in this area now when a sambar is doing this when it is um, engaged in this particular behavior a tiger might very easily come and hunt this tiger uh, the sambar because the because the sambar is not putting any attention on the tigers it is only putting its attention to, to the other members of its own species so this also increases a risk of predation but even with all of these costs we see territorial behavior because it has it provides certain benefits if you have a territory you have an exclusive access to resources so you uh, if a tiger has defended this territory so all the animals that are inside this territory are now food for this particular tiger it does not have to share these animals or these prey species with the other tigers if there are any tigresses in this territory it does not have to share it its mates with the other tigers so it provides an exclusive access to resources and once it has been established territory reduces competition why because in the earlier situation if you were allowing this tiger to enter into this area so both of these animals would have been using the same area so there would have been much greater competition but once you have defended this territory once you have excluded this tiger outside so then the amount of competition is much less and one more benefit is that it regulates the size of the population because for instance uh here we observed that you have these penguins and each of these is maintaining a territory and each of these will require this territory and will not permit anybody else or any other penguin to enter into its own territory so for instance if the total area of beach is say a square meters and area of territory for each pair is a square meters so then the number of pairs that can be found in this beach will be given by capital a divided by small a and if the number of pairs so the number of penguin pairs if it is greater than this value of capital a divided by small a so in that case they will not find any space for breeding so they will not find any amount of sand nearby to uh, to have their own nest so it automatically this behavior of territoriality it automatically puts a check on the size of the population so this is also another benefit that we get from the territorial behavior so this is why we see territorial behaviors even though we have so many costs that are involved with having a territory and this territorial behavior is also regulated by the environment because an animal wants to have a territory so uh, the the benefits that an animal is getting out of a territory is that it 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 gets an exclusive access to the resources now for instance there is a bird and this bird say requires 100 grams of insects 
as food every day now this bird is not going to defend a territory that can provide it with say 200 grams of insects every day because if it has this much amount of territory and this much amount of territory gives it 100 grams of insects every day and if it wanted a larger territory say this much excess territory so this territory also gives it more amount of insects every day but it only requires this much so in that case why should it use its energy to defend a much greater area than is required right so in that case it will not defend this area and it will allow some other bird to take this area as a second territory so this is bird one and it will allow a second bird to take this area as its own territory so you'll have these two territories now what happens if we increase the the number of insects that are available to this bird in this area itself so in place of this area providing it with 100 grams of insect suppose we added more number of insects into this territory so that this area in place of providing 100 grams starts providing 200 grams of insects in that case would this bird reduce its area so it turns out that if you do that the bird will reduce its area by half so the amount of insects that is being provided in this particular patch of land is an environmental phenomenon so it is something that is being regulated by the environment so for instance if you have more amount of winds that bring in more insects into this territory so this territory will have more number of insects or for instance if uh, the if there is a bloom of flowers and so insects are having more flowers to feed on so the number of insects would grow up so that is an environmental phenomenon and that is regulating a behavior which is territoriality the size of the territory so in this study what was done is here we have flower density so flower density was increased experimentally and here we have the size of the territory and as we can see if you have a less flower density you go for a larger size territory if you have more number of flowers so you have more amount of food you go for a lesser size of a territory so we can say that there are a number of behaviors that get regulated by the environment and territorialities so in essence uh, the study of behaviors or behavioral ecology provides us answers or provides us explanations to a number of phenomena that we observe in nature be it population interactions be it community interactions or ecosystem interactions and so on and so study of behaviors or behavioral ecology is an extremely integral part of the study of ecology now the, the next question is how do we study the behaviors so there are a number of methods through which we study behaviors one behavior is to discern information from the activity patterns so this is one example so in this case we have plotted time on the uh, x axis so it goes from 12 o'clock in the midnight which is 0000, 0, 0, 0 and then till 2400 0, 0. so this is 6 o'clock in the morning this is 12 o'clock in the afternoon this is 6 o'clock in the evening and on the y axis we have density of animals and we have plotted uh, this black line shows the tiger density and the uh, this dashed line shows the chital density or the chital activity that is seen at that particular point of time now here we observe that both of these curves do not match each other so the amount of uh, of uh, concordance between both of these or the amount of overlap between both of these is just about 24 percent now why is that so now if we see this is the time where chetals are most active so they are most active during early day and during late in the evening they rest for some time in the afternoon but they are active at these two points now why are they active most during these two points well because the tigers are not that much active at that particular time so tigers are more active during the night time so between 12 o'clock in the midnight and 6 o'clock in the morning the tigers are more active and from 6 o'clock in the evening to 12 o'clock in the midnight they are more active so in that case the, the cheetahs are trying to 
avoid their predators. So, this is a behavior of avoidance. But at the same time, there has to be some amount of overlap between both of these. Why? Because the tiger wants to have some amount of overlap because if there is absolutely no overlap, so in that case it will not be able to prey upon or predate upon the cheetahs. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the overlaps between two carnivores, so tiger and jackal will observe that there is a much greater overlap between both of these. So, here again the black line is the tiger and the dashed blue line is the jackal and here we observe that the amount of overlap is as greater as 67 percent. So, this is one uh, example through which we can discern different behaviors and why they are happening by looking at the activity patterns. The second way is by making of ethograms. Now, an ethogram is an inventory of behaviors that is exhibited by an animal during a behavior exercise. So, how do we make an ethogram? So, it is an inventory of behavior. So, we are observing the animals and we are making an inventory of what this animal is doing. So, we begin by a description of the study site, define the behavior. So, we need to exactly uh, define what, what do we mean by walking, what do we mean by standing and so on. And then we do a, a scan sampling and a focal animal study and then we go for time budget analysis. So, for instance, this is uh, one exercise that we did in Sariska. So, there was a water body, there was this elevated road and on this side we had some cheetahs and there were some trees here. So, this is the description of the study site and then we define different acts like sitting is abdomen touching the ground, legs folded and stationary, standing is all hooves touching the ground, legs straight, animal stationary uh, and this is a subdominant interval during walking or feeding and so on. So, we define sitting, standing, walking, looking, feeding, running, auto grooming. Auto grooming is when an animal is screening itself or scratching or licking some part of it, its own body. Allo grooming is when the animal is cleaning or scratching or licking some part of somebody else's body. So, we have defined all of these acts. Once we have defined these behaviors, we next want to know what each and every animal is doing during the period of our analysis. So, for that we go for two kinds of studies, one goes by the name of scan sampling and the second is the focal animal sampling. Now, in the case of scan sampling, if we have n number of individuals, so we start with the first individual and we make a note of the time and what this animal is doing, then next what this animal is doing, next what this is doing and so on till we go to the last animal. So, th in this way we are performing a scan of their behaviors from one end to the next end and then we will repeat these behaviors to get a table something like this. So, in this table here we have the starting time and the ending time and at this time, so we started at 1455 and we ended at 1456. So, during this time the adult male in this scene was walking, the second ma adult male was feeding, the, uh, the third adult male was feeding and so on. So, in this case we are making a scan of what every animal is doing in that particular time. The second way is a focal animal study. Now, in the focal animal study we focus on one particular individual. So, in this case if, coming back to the drawing board we will see that suppose we are focusing on this animal. So, we will observe the behaviors of this particular animal for a designated period of time. Once that is done then we will move to another animal and, be, uh, and witness its behavior or observe or make a note of the behaviors of this animal for a particular designated time. So, in that case we will come up with this table. So, in this table it says that for the first individual that is the adult male it showed all these different behaviors from, from these to these times. So, it did feeding from 15 14 40 to 15 15 0 5 and it spent 25 seconds here. From after that it shifted from feeding to walking. So, 15 uh, here we had ended at 15 15 0 5. So, from 15 15 0 5 till 15 15 27 for 22 seconds it did walking and so on. So, by this method we can understand what each and every animal is doing for the designated periods of time and from that we can come up with a time budget table or a time budget graph. So, this graph can be in terms of uh, seconds or in terms of percentages or in terms of a pie chart. So, here what we are observing is that feeding is the most dominant behavior that was shown in this particular group. So, as much as 44 percent of time was being spent on feeding 
and 30 percent time was spent on walking which might be a behavior that is correlated with feeding because the animal uh, has fed on grasses somewhere and then it moves on then feeds again then moves on and so on and then it spent as much as 17 percent of time looking around now this looking is ma mainly looking for the predators now if we have a situation in which there is a tiger nearby so in that case these two values will probably go down and looking will increase. So, this is a way in which we understand the behaviors, we, may, we make a note of behaviors to understand how that is playing a role in the ecology. So, for instance, in uh, our observations, we saw that the, the dominant behaviors were feeding, walking and looking as we saw in the pie chart. Juveniles spend less time looking than adults and sub adults. Uh, possibly because of parental protection. So, just by looking at their behaviors, we can make this uh, inference that because juveniles are spending less amount of time looking around, but their parents are spending much more time looking around. So, there is a sense of parental protection that is also being provided. So, here we are looking at population level interactions where uh, the parents are looking out for the uh, children and then sub adult males spend considerable time in auto grooming. So, sub adult males are now getting into the uh, stage of, of adulthood in which case they will also be able to mate. So, at this particular stage they spend a considerable amount of time in auto grooming. So, then we can make a correlation between different ages and different kinds of behaviors. So, in this way ethograms in time budget analysis can help us record and understand the behaviors of animals with important implications for ecology. So, in this lecture what we saw is that different behaviors are there because they have been evolutionarily selected. So, these behaviors have been selected because they are providing some amount of fitness to the individual or to the group. Now, what is that fitness? Why are, are some behaviors shown by certain organisms and not by others can be inferred by looking at the cost and benefits of any particular behavior. So, a behavior like territoriality or a behavior like uh, avoiding of, of predators can be understood by looking at the cost and benefits. And an animal will perform a behavior only when the benefits are greater than the cost. So, it is in a net profit. And then by looking at the cost and benefits, we can even come to a conclusion about what is the most optimum level of behavior that an animal should depict. So, uh, uh, the most optimal behavior will, will be where the benefit is much more greater than the cost. So, the profit is maximized. So, that is the behavior that will be shown. We also looked at the concepts of kin selection and group selection. So, even if there is a behavior that is not favoring yourself, but you are able to save a number of individuals that are related to yourself. So, in that case evolution will select this behavior because by this way the, the genes that are responsible for such a behavior get selected and uh, they are able to propagate themselves. So, the fitness increases and with that those particular genes that are uh, responsible for the altruistic behaviors also increase. And finally, we looked at different methods through which we understand these behaviors, we uh, uh, through which we, we go to the field and observe these animals and note down their different behaviors to make correlations that are important for population ecology, community ecology and so on. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.